Okay, so I think uh, we can start. Thank you so much, everyone, for attending to today's talk. So the main outcome of today is to uh, serm, serve with you some key findings of our latest studies that we did in collaboration with LA Research and the Twitter group about this state of OSPOS and also serve with you some insights of what is the status of OSPOS in Asia. So for those who doesn't know me, uh, my name is Ana Jimenez. I'm the OSPO project manager at Twitter Group that is a Linux Foundation uh, project and community. I formerly work at Viterja, more in the data science uh, field in software development analytics. So I'm a data scientist and I'm also a DevRel. And currently, when I have time, I try to contribute to open chain that is more focused on licensing and compliance and standards. In our source commons, that is a community focused on developing open source internal culture within organizations. The Tudor group, of course, that is uh, the um, organization I'm involved in. And Chaos, that is another Linux Foundation project focused on uh, measuring the health of the community and the open source projects. And in case you want to uh, follow me or get in touch with me, uh, that is my WeChat uh, that you can scan and just add me as a friend. So I know some of you are already part of an OSPO team or a similar initiative, but uh, I'm pretty sure there might be other people that maybe this is the first time they hear about what it, the, the term OSPO. So I'm gonna give a short introduction before deep dive into the insights. So an OSPO is defined as the linchpin, so the entity are the people uh, that is in touch with the organization and the open source projects and community. So um, they are collaborating internally with many, many areas within the organization that they need to understand open source, they need to engage with open source, and is in the shape of compliance and legal, so they collaborate with the legal department, security department, HR team to uh, how to um, onboard or maybe uh, hire new developers from the open source communities, uh, the business team on a strategy and of course the engineering team, but also because they are engaging with open source and open source is a community of communities, they also need to engage with uh, the developers of those open source projects the maintainers of those open source projects, and the open source foundations of uh, where those projects are hosted. They provide support, advice, knowledge, strategy. And even though you might not call your entity of open source operations an OSPO, it's, in, it's more important not the term, but the essence that this name implies. As I mentioned, they um, collaborate across many layers within the organization. This is one of our recent works in our community, uh, on a, 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 an initiative called the OSPA book where the community define this OSPA flower and the areas of work that the OSPA really needs to take care about. And um, in a nutshell, I think uh, this uh, sketch uh, clarifies and integrates better like the essence of the OSPO. It puts order into chaos. It gives strategic alignment to the organization and without harming the open source ecosystem, but uh, keeping the sustainability of the open source projects. And why is this important? Well, if I tell you right now, uh, in your organization, do, do you have a security team? Do you have a CISO team? I'm pretty sure you have. And if I tell you why do you why you have a security team, you will say, well, because that is critical for our uh, business, for our um, for keeping us alive, because security is so so important. And why then we don't say the same when thinking about OSPOS? In one of our, in our studies, we found out that the OSPOS, 93% of the OSPOS collaborates with the security team. It's important, goes beyond um, man managing open source. It's because open source is integrated 
into every modern application nowadays. So at the same time, and the same way an organization has a marketing team, an organization should be thinking about adopting a strategic posture around open source because it's integrated in the IT uh, development, the AT strategy. So um, what we found out in this study that we do every, every year in collaboration with LF Research and this year also in partnership with this great organization, some of them also from, uh, coming from the, the Chinese uh, community, uh, we found three key findings. The first one, OSPOs are becoming mainstream in general, uh, but particularly also we found a huge increase in Asia. We will just go through that in a minute. Also, uh, we deep dive into the value of the OSPO and how OSPOs are improving security to build more secure software and uh, to help and support into the sustainability of open source projects. And finally, um, also this uh, research allow us to define some uh, next steps and challenges and year ahead that I would like to share with you. Uh, so to put us uh, into context, so this is study, the demographics, uh, we had a sample size of 489 uh, participants taking the survey. So 20% of those, of that sample size comes from Asia Pacific. Um, I think it's the highest uh, percentage of people from Asia Pacific taking the survey in all these years that we have been conducted this survey. So it's a really huge amount of people. And uh, well, that is uh, quite uh, normal that most of these, of these people come from the IT field, so 56%. But we did also have people from government entity or agencies, from academic or research institutions. And of course, uh, a lot of people, 28% uh, of end users organizations that consume IT products or services. So the major finding we found was about OSP growth. Uh, we saw a 32% increase. So it's great because we did, that means that 66% of organizations um, now recognize this importance of value of open source software, but I think in the next years ahead, we can do better. Particularly, um, if you see in general, in across all the regions, we found an increase from 2022 to 2023, but uh, the, the dark blue is Asia Pacific. Can you see that come went to 26% to 54% in just one year? So I think this is really impressive. And um, I think these are good news. But again, um, I think we, we will say, say now in the future, but I think now is okay. Organizations are waking up, they're starting to build an OSPO. How can we perceive this OSPO? Ca how can we improve the sustainability of that OSPO in the organization? Another finding was about security. So um, this was a new question we added in today's, in, in this year's survey. We wanted to know um, how many of these OSPOs collaborate with the security team and give support to the security team. So we ask them, um, yeah, like does your OSPO or initiative directly address open source security issues? We found out that 69% uh, 60, uh, made decisions on security issues and others, even though they didn't make decisions, they provided advice. So a total of 93% of OSPOs um, this year provided advice on the security issues. So this is about like OSPOs are playing a higher role, an important role on risk management. And I think this is a really key topic to address. And you might be thinking, well, what about generative AI now that it's so popular? Well, uh, actually one of the uh, things we do in, in Tudor Group is doing these monthly meetings. And in the last one, we had a panel discussions 
on uh, how, what is the role of OSPOS in internal AI compliance programs. Uh, this is, of course, is something that I think it needs more evolution because this is pretty new. But in this, um, in this panel discussion that is recorded and people can already see it, uh, we, 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 we saw that there were OSPOS getting involved uh, with the, and talking with the AI ethical team or the AI compliance team to help them build this compliance program. And also regarding innovation, uh, so we've seen that OSPOS uh, helping to move from a nice to have thing, uh, open source is a nice to have thing, to integrating open source in IT strategy. So for instance, the top uh, technologies that OSPOS actually engages and are um, paying, uh, uh, having activity is Cloud containers, AI, machine learning, and analytics. And it's not also about that they are getting involved in these technologies, but they are helping to improve open source best practices within the organization. So we found out that 96% of organizations that had an OSPO have driven significant improvement to software development best practices. And the ones that have an OSPO are four more times likely to provide upstream contributions, so to contribute back to the community. That I think it's a, some organizations might be understanding the value of using open source, uh, but sometimes go going beyond and go to the step of contributing is a really hard thing. And this is really interesting to find out that maybe because they have a, such a strategic position around open source, the organization can understand by their contributing and they are ready or more ready to um, provide upstream contributions. Uh, and of course, software is becoming more software at scale. Organizations are not managing just one or two open source projects. We are talking about thousands of open source projects that has open source dependencies and that relies on other open source projects. So being able to measure that and to have an automated process, it's really important. Many OSPOs started from the legal and compliance ground uh, un unless, even though this is not the only thing that an OSPO take care of, but they have been doing pretty good on having an automated process for addressing this licenses compliance. But what are the challenges? Because even though we have found really great insights and positive feedback on how OSPOs are helping the organizations and the open source ecosystems, we also find some OSPO barriers that are important to address. In general, um, organizations reported uh, that um, they might uh, reduce their funding in OSPOs for the next year ahead. So we moved to 12% of respondents saying that last year to 23% if 2023. And I think this relies on the value of the OSPO and how that message uh, is sometimes not fully understood by the stakeholders uh, and thus not getting this uh, financial support. So what can we do uh, to address this challenge? Uh, what are the next steps and recommendations? So what I'm gonna be sharing with you is some of the um, insights and recommendations that we are developing in our community. Um, this is uh, my own opinion, and I really hope that you can maybe have a great conversation afterwards, whether or not this can help for organizations in China, for instance. So the first one is about um, being clear about the message and the scope. Mm, uh, there have been a lot of organizations that I've heard with an OSPO that they only focus on compliance. Specifically, uh, I come from uh, Europe and based in Madrid, Spain. In Europe, uh, we have a lot of regulations and many of the OSPOs that I met there, 
they were on the very first step of just focusing on compliance, which is great because it's a really important topic. Uh, but this is not a holistic approach. By holistic, I mean giving a, core me a whole message of open source that implies governance, community engagement, and a strategy. And in all these steps, an OSPO usually provides this education to the organization, uh, guidance, like mentorship, advocacy, and uh, sustainability of the projects. And I know it's, it's hard because it's not just about going to, some, to a team or to the stakeholders and say, hey, this is open source, look how cool we are, and uh, this is how you should do it. No, I mean, I'm pretty sure the organization has different product lines, and uh, you need to drift this cultural change to the developers, but also to the managers that are approving the process and needs to understand like, open source is important, I should take a look to this pull request, and also to the stakeholders to um, keep financing this initiative, right? Uh, so this is one of the many structures uh, that from a certain OSPO, I cannot say the name, but uh, they, they added these OSPO leaders uh, in the middle that they talk with managers, uh, check to the business units, and at the same time, they go directly and talk with the open source community. So having this linchpin between these three layers is really, really important. And also, keeping in mind that uh, the OSPO needs to operate in the management level, the OSPO level, like within the OSPO, employee level, and business units. Um, this doesn't take, like, it's, it, this is not something that in just one year an organization can accomplish. Like, I found OSPOs that they, they are now five years old, and they're still in the very user phase, trying to see, like, getting the first contributions done into open source projects. So um, an organization might want to take a look to the uh, activity and go step by step. There are others that they're approaching this like at the, at the same time. That depends on the culture of the organization and, and their um, understanding to open source. Uh, but I think it's important that when you're sharing the value, you need to talk the language of many different teams. So you need to prove the value of for, for HR, also for developers and for the IT team, also what means this for the brand, what means this for the customer, what this means for uh, the cost of the organization. So it's really hard to think about that because also you need to think of these values, what means in the participation, in the contribution, and also on the leadership phase. Another, another thing that maybe it's important to take care of is build career paths internally. I know like many OSPOs focus a lot on this. Uh, so this is providing training and certifications on open source. Uh, building or creating internal summits and conference where they, for instance, where the developers internally in the organizations present on these are the open source projects we are contributing, this is we how we have been doing. Also maybe inviting some um, global speakers uh, to talk about like how all the OSPOs are doing, and also maybe building some mentorship programs. And the tricky thing of this is that uh, this needs to be maybe customized to every layer. So how, how do you provide training and certification to the management level? Or how do you provide training and certification to the empl on a, an employee level, that might slightly be different, and the content might be also differ. And the and one of the I think most important things is collaborate. Uh, we've seen that collaboration with open source organizations is the number one responsibility of an OSPO or open source initiative in this survey report. And what we mean by collaboration is collaborating with other OSPOs that maybe you have common goals, you want to build, uh, maybe for instance, in Europe, uh, the automotive industry. They have really specific software 
uh, with, with their regulations and they really wanted to build a neutral and a common ground to build common tooling where most of the automotive companies in Europe can use it and contribute to that. So that is, for instance, a really great example of collaboration. Um, also with open source foundations. So for instance, if your projects are in the CNCF ecosystem or you're contributing to any of the projects of the CNCF ecosystems, you want to build the OSPO, can act as at least linchpins to build this collaboration. And of course, uh, projects outside foundations maybe, and communities, and by communities, I don't only mean look at global communities. For instance, the Tutor Group operates a little, uh, globally, but I think it's also important to build partnerships with local communities, uh, where, for instance, in some places where, like, English is not the first language. Uh, I mean, for instance, in China, I think it's really important to also promote the local language. Um, and I, I'm come from Spain. English is not my first language; it's Spanish. And I, I hap it happens the same. We have local communities that we talk in Spanish because sometimes it's better understood by the people that are engaging in that community. So um, I think I didn't introduce it to the group. So if I would like to introduce now, we are a group. Uh, we are an open source project and. A, communi a, OSP, a community of OSPO practitioners uh, that we are developing best practices, guide resources to on how to build effective OSPOs and to uh, improve the sustainability of this open source project program offices across sectors and regions. Um, we have developed, the community has developed a long uh, list of resources we have an OSPO glossary, studies, a mind map, guides, case studies, brain book, and also from China, uh, the local community uh, has also been providing grateful uh, contributions to the translations of some of these resources. Um, this, uh, there are many different ways uh, that you can contribute or be support to the group. If you're a representative for our organization uh, doing open source, uh, you can uh, support the us as a um, as a general with general members. There are some organizations in China that are already general members of Tutor Group and has been doing great work with this for this community. But if, uh, for instance, you are not our organization, but you are coming for a foundation or an open source project or a community that are helping OSPOs. We all also have the OSPO Associates program. We already have some um, organizations within LF, outside LF, that has been collaborating with us with the OSPOlogy project and initiative that is an initiative under Tutor Group. And um, if you are an individual, you are not representing an organization, you can also support Tudu as an OSPO ambassador. This is our latest program we launched this year. And in our website, you can find all this information. And to end up with, I just wanted to share some um, OSPO resources. These are not just Tudu resources. For instance, we also have uh, we, uh, I also wanted to share some OSPO studies conducted by uh, um, a Chinese organization here uh, uh, about the OSPO, uh, a set of OSPO case studies uh, from Chinese companies, and I think it's great. It's fully in Chinese, so I hope I, I hope you you could take a look. Uh, we on the Tudor side, we also had a deep dive into open source program offices. We do have a, chi a Chinese translation, so uh, you might check it out on the LF website. And the evolution of the open source program office also is on in Chinese. Uh, I, I know like there were some contributions and we have the Chinese version. There are also communities. Uh, the uh, from LF APAC of OSPO SIG, they have a WeChat local community where Everything is fully in Chinese, and I think they are doing a great job. I see some evangelists here, uh, so thank you so much for the work you're doing. And on to the side, we do to the virtual meetings. So we have the Ospology Global to learn. And in case you would like to contribute, you can join our working groups that happens weekly. And that's all. All this information is on our website, tutorgroup.org. Thank you so much, Xie and um, enjoy the conference.
have a, a lot of ospo to do ospoloch uh, webinar a very good topic so do we have video recording on website or c where can we get funding yeah so um coming back yeah to the virtual meetings. So we have Ospology. Ospology is an initiative under a tutor group. And uh, there, these are global uh, panel discussions. So the one that I said about the compliance AI programs, we have this every month. And if you cannot join, uh, we record those and uh, upload it in the both. In the registration page, uh, that is LF and oh, the Linux okay. Foundation community, and also on YouTube. Okay, mm -hmm. okay. So, oh, YouTube to do channel. Yes. Fine, good. Thank you. Hi. Um, so, you mentioned uh, also people need to talk to a lot of people around, right? Uh, legal folks compliance experts mm. and also development teams. Uh, but usually in uh, like a large enterprise, you already have like dedicated teams in those areas. Mm -hmm. So we often face the problem that um, you are not like regard there's a dedicated field for open source legal stuff or open source compliance stuff or especially for development. Mm -hmm. uh, right. If you have a project that has a development team, uh, usually they don't consider like uh, um, uh, us like part of part of the team. Although we know the technology well. So um, back to the point. My question is: I think it's a taller to 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 be a great uh, OSPO runner. So. Is there any like suggestions for how uh, how do we talk to those teams, you know, related teams, as establish the uh, professionality mm. among those, and uh, be view like a, a truly lead that can convince the the tech people, the legal people, the mm -hmm. all the other. Yeah, um, that's a really good question. And uh, before uh, sharing some of the insights from what all the OSPOs um, have been doing in the past. I would like to mention that it depends on the organizational culture and uh, how, like, how well does those teams know about open source and how well it's integrated. So uh, I, even though there are some best practices that organizations are serving, maybe you cannot just copy and paste that. You might to address it to your organizational needs. Saying that, what I've heard from OSPOs around the world, uh, they have implemented a matrix of experts. And this matrix of experts usually came from the same team. Like for instance, they found a champion engine on the engineering team, someone that is part of that team. They train them into open source, uh, that person specifically. So then they got the chance that person has both knowledges, the open source knowledges, and also that it has the trust of their team. Like they can easily communicate because they know the internal processes and policies and so on. Um, as I said, it's not something that in just one day you can have. It's it takes a lot, and and maybe that is one of the major issues that OSPOs are facing right now with the layoffs. That maybe stakeholders are like. Oh, I don't see any improvements. I don't see where is where is the facts. What what are the, what is happening? And it's just like they need more time. <laughs> like it takes a village. Any other questions? It's uh, an um, elf member. How do we apply to it? Existing alpha members. Oh uh, yeah, to to the group you mean? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, um, if you're our organization that uh, has an OSPO, or um, are working on an open source initiative, let let me go back to the slides where I saw that. Uh, yeah, so there are three ways. So this is as an organization, uh, we have in our page, a jo if you go to the join page, it's filling up a uh, form. Um, if you're an LF member already, 
uh, you can join to do at no cost. Uh, and it's just filling up a form, an application form, and the process takes like roughly three days. Um, if you are coming from a foundation or for an open source project that wants to collaborate more with OSPOS and build initiatives together, you can do that as an associate. And again, there are specific pages where they, you need to submit like a PR saying, I want to join as an associate because I have this initiative or this proposal. And if you're an ambassador, you do, there is also like a list of responsibilities and uh, benefits of being an, an, a to-do ambassador as individual. I, I hope this answers to your question. Oh, okay. All right, so um, if there are no other questions, uh, thank you so much and enjoy.